We have a very special day today. So before we get started, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, today. What a privilege to be in your house. Lord, we thank you so much. You are magnificent. Lord, we've had a wonderful time this morning just praising you and worshiping. And Lord, that is just going to continue right here, right now, as we do what you have for us this morning. Lord, I am so looking forward to this. This is so wonderful. And I just give you praise, Lord, for all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We have a special service today. Um, we have several people who have um, felt that they have been called of God to specifically do the face-to-face -face healing ministry in people's lives, okay? Now, this doesn't happen very often. Um, fact is, it's never happened to me. Um, all the ministries that I've been part of, all the things and, and that people have they've done different services, different things for us, and this is one of the things that we had learned how to do a while back because it's as scriptural as the day is long. There's a, a reason for it. There's a, an anointing that is to be passed on. Now, as soon as you start talking about anointing, then people all have some, all sorts of different ideas about how that works. And so, you know, is there anything magical about the oil? No. What is it? Oil. It's olive oil. It's good olive oil. <laughs> okay. It has some extra stuff in it that I've added. Make it smell really pretty. It's going to be fun. Is there anything magical about it? No. Can you have the ministry without being anointed in oil? Yeah. That's not the issue. The issue is we want to do everything that we can possibly do to show and to enhance what God is doing through lives. Okay? But when we don't understand the anointing, it makes it kind of difficult. So, okay, understanding the anointing. How fun. How fun. We're going to have a, a day of a service where we establish a ministry, where we establish ministry in people's lives. Um, what's the idea behind all this? Is that, you know, are these people special? Absolutely. Are they different than you? No. Does that make you special? Yeah. What does that mean? That means that every single person in this room, as long as you are breathing and you have a heartbeat, you are called of God to minister. Everybody is a minister here. Every single one. Whether you're realizing your ministry or walking in what God has called you to do, now that's a whole other issue. Okay, there's a lot of things that we have found in people's lives. The longer I've been ministering to find out that people have been saying, yeah, God wanted me to do this 30 years ago. And I said no. What is kind of interesting about all that is God is not too fragile. Every single one of us has said no to him in some way, shape, or form. Did that stall him from working on us? No. Did it even impair him in any way, shape, or form? No. Did it even slow him down hardly? No. Okay, he's still working. So let's, I, I got on to Webster's 1860 dictionary. Okay. Hey, if you, if you ever want a really good dictionary, you get that one. Because Webster was as Christian as the day is long, man. And these definitions are all godly. And it's just like really fascinating to see how all this works. But... To anoint. Number one, to pour oil on, to smear or rub over with oil or unctuous substances. We get to do unctuous substances. <laughs> All right. Also, to spread over as oil. We say the man anoints another or the oil anoints him. Number two, to consecrate by unction or the use of oil. Three, to smear or daub. Four, to prepare in allusion to the consecration use of oil. To anoint the head with oil, Psalm 23 seems to signify to communicate the consolations of the Holy Spirit. 
The use of oil in consecrations was of high antiquity. Kings, prophets, and priests were set apart or consecrated by their offices by the use of oil. Hence, the peculiar application of the term anointed to Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to explain all that. But it's kind of interesting. If you even look on that dictionary and you go anointing, he has nothing about the anointing of getting the anointing of the Holy Spirit in service. All it talks about is oil. Webster, the only thing he knew about anointing was oil. Interesting concept. Let's talk about kings. Now, kings, there are three types of people who were anointed with oil and anointed, okay, by the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. These three were kings, prophets, and priests. Kings. From the beginning, each king has been anointed. Now, this is kind of fascinating. They were anointed to service. But that didn't mean that they were automatically godly. Every king was anointed, even the bad ones. Manasseh was also anointed. What happened? Well, a really raging bad news guy got on his knees before somebody and they dumped oil on him and a really bad news guy got up. Oily. There was no difference. Did God use him? <laughs> Yeah, because he was the king of Israel. So he, yeah, God had some parts for him, but hey, did he listen to God? No. Was he bad news? Yeah. Okay. But each king was anointed. Oil was poured over their head. Uh, oil is a type in the scripture of the Holy Spirit of God. That's, it's kind of one of those funny little things, because as you will find out, as we get to pouring oil, okay, for one, it never says, take a little finger full and dab them on the forehead and a little cross thing, and that's anointed with oil. No, all of the scripture is about dumping, pouring. So the first time, <laughs> uh, when I f first started getting into healing, we had a man in our church uh, who was dying of hepatitis. I don't know which one, can't remember. But we all prayed for him. Uh, none of us knew anything about healing. We were all new in all this or stuff. And I was just the youth pastor. And he was the father of one of the kids in my youth group. He was in the hospital. So I made arrangements with the nurses there. One of the nurses, the head nurse on that floor was uh, going to our church. And he let us have a chair right outside this guy's room. And we had prayer vigil for him 24 hours. There was somebody outside praying for him 24 hours, okay? But I read in the scriptures where it says, if you want healing, you anoint them with oil, right out of James chapter 5. Okay, if anyone's sick, let him call the elders, they'll anoint him with oil, and the prayer of faith will raise him up. And so I took a jar of oil. I didn't take a gallon, but I also got whatever you could buy at the store. That's a lot of oil, okay? And I went into his hospital room, and talked to him about it. Uh, he was renegade from the church. The church had hurt him very badly, and he was on the run from all churches and said all churches were bad. And so here comes his son getting involved in my youth group, okay? Life got interesting. So I came into his room and talked to him about that. And I says, I don't know where you stand as far as healing is concerned. I says, but your family is very concerned for you. And we want you to know that God loves you still. And all the people that hurt you, they just hurt you. They're not representatives of the church. God loves you. And so we started talking about it. And I says, I would like to pray for you and anoint you with oil. He says, I am in. Go for it. Yes, sir. So I laid hands on him, and I proceeded to dump this whole jar of oil on him. It covered everything. Everything in this hospital room was covered with oil. It just was everywhere. The nurses didn't want to clean it all off because they thought it was some ritual thing. I went in there the next day, and he's sitting there saying, Can I wipe any of this off? Oh, God. See, I didn't know what I was doing. I've learned a little bit since then. Hallelujah. The question is, was he healed? 
That night, his son was sitting out doing the overnight shift, praying for him outside his room, and his door was open a little bit. He heard his dad talking to Jesus, getting everything right over the last three decades of him running from God. He got it right with Jesus. He says, if only I had known that I could have been closer to you this whole time. And he says, I love you. I want this. And he died. His son heard him in the ultimate healing. Okay, and so I do not consider that a failure. <laughs> First person I ever anointed with oil died. You guys are in trouble. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know. Okay, it's <laughs> but then it can only go uphill from there, right? So, okay, it's a type of the Holy Spirit. It it permeates everything, and you guys will find out that as they are anointed with oil, when they go to shake hands with you later, everybody's going to get oiled up. It's the way it is. Okay? Empowered to be king and to use authority. This is very important. They were anointed because God wanted them empowered to use their authority and to be anointed as king to be godly. That was the whole idea behind it. It was misused after that, but at the beginning it was used for this. They had a spiritual function. It was a spiritual function that affected the earth, because that's where their reign was, and affected people's souls, because that's who they reigned over. Okay, so it's a spiritual function that affected earth and soul. Anybody catch the hint on that? It's not just spiritual. What you guys are going to be experiencing is you're going to have an anointing that's going to be affecting earth and soul. That's awesome. Just thought I'd let you know. That's too cool. It shows, by the way, that this power that you're going to be having or that you do have and all this stuff that is there is not inherent in your flesh. It's not about your flesh. This is a spirit thing. It's the spirit of God. Pretty cool. It's enhanced by the Spirit himself. 1 Samuel 9, 15 through 16, it says this, And Jehovah revealed in Samuel's ear one day before Saul came, saying, At this time tomorrow I will send you a man out of the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him for the leader, to, for the leader over my people Israel. And he shall save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people, for his cry has come up to me. So he's telling Samuel, Anoint Saul. Now, Saul was not God's first choice. They wanted, they wanted a king now. And God says, you're not ready for it yet. And they said, we want it now. And they got Saul. Saul, you'll find out, had some issues if you read it. <laughs> and so we're going to fast forward very quickly to 1 Samuel 16, 1 and verse 13. And it says, And Jehovah said to Samuel, Until when will you mourn for Saul? For I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Thank you. Fill your horn with oil and go. Fill your horn with oil and go. Not, not sprinkling, not dripping. Fill your horn with oil and head out. And I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have seen a king for me among his sons. Verse 13. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of Jehovah came upon David from that day and onward, and Samuel rose up and went home to Ramah. Wow. Here's this shepherd boy out there. All of a sudden, he's anointed for king. How long did it take for him to become king? Years. Years. But here he is, and what's he going to do? Next day, he's heading out to the sheep again. But now he smells of oil instead of sheep. <laughs> That's a good thing anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Prophets. Now this is kind of a little bit trickier thing in the scripture because it's done more privately. It was done in the schools of the prophet. It was done in different things of the prophets, but it's just kind of a, didn't, there's not a lot of scriptures about it because it's not before men, but before God. Okay. There was not a, even though there was an office of a prophet, kind of, and there was people who were prophets who were there, but they were not anointed by people so that people did not think that they had the power of the prophet. The prophet was able to speak whatever he wanted anywhere. So his anointing was there, okay? They spoke for God alone, and 
So someone, some of them had no one around to anoint them. There was no one around to do it. Okay? Jeremiah being one. But God just called him out of the middle. There's nobody around. God called him. But they're known by their ability to hear from God and to speak his word. Very, very good. But here's what's really cool. They could speak to kings. Oh, wait a minute. I thought the kings were anointed. They were. And here comes a different anointing called the prophet anointing that speaks to kings. Just because a person is anointed doesn't mean they're top of the food chain. Okay? You've got, you've got you better think about it. All it means is that you're a vessel to be used. Not under human control or authority. That's pretty awesome. Look at this scripture. This is fascinating. First Chronicles 16, 21 and 22 says this. He has not allowed any to oppress them. Yea, for their sake, he has reproved kings. And what did he say? Touch not my anointed ones and do my prophets no evil. So he's talking to the kings who are the anointed ones also. Don't mess with my anointed ones and don't do my prophets any evil. See, so that we know that the prophets were anointed. Pretty exciting. Touch not my anointed ones. Priests. I kind of like priesthood and the discussion thereof a little. I bring that up oh, every now and then. Yeah. But this started with the first priest. His name was Aaron. And he was a high priest, too. Started with him. The ceremonies for priests' anointing were very public. Very public. They did it out in front of God and everybody. That was the whole idea. Why? Because what are the three ministries of a priest? Represent God to the people, the people to God, and minister to God. Okay. The three m roles of a priest is to minister to God, then represent God to the people, and then represent the people to God. The issue was that the priests were anointed before the people because they represented God to the people, and they represented the people to God. And they had to see that the anointing was there, and their first function was to minister to God. So they represented both God and man. It had to be very, very public. They were empowered to minister to God with impunity. That was the anointing on them to minister. Okay? Now you got to understand that they're consecrated to God, consecrated to God their entire lives. Even if they were disqualified for the priesthood. They're still consecrated as priests before God, even if they're disqualified for the priesthood. That's interesting. Their inheritance, by the way, was only from God. The Levites had no inheritance. They were a tribe of priests. So they had no inheritance. Only from God. Their lives were not their own. They were submitted totally to God. Now, what is really, really important is that the face-to-face -face ministry, is a one-on-one -on -one ministry, is an absolutely priestly function. Totally priestly function. What do you do in a face-to-face -face encounter? Okay, well, for one, you'd better be ministering to God before you ever get in there. But when you're in a session with somebody, what are you doing? You're representing God to them. You're bringing them, and you're representing them to God. You're bringing them face-to-face -to, -face to God. That's the whole idea behind it. It's a totally priestly function. And then to bring the things that God has and minister to them. So it's a priesthood anointing, very, very big. Exodus 30, 30 through 32 says, And you shall take the oil of anointing, and you shall pour on his head, and shall anoint him. I didn't put all the scriptures up there on that one, just, just that one verse. But it's just, you've got to pour oil over them. You've got to pour the oil. Take the oil of anointing and pour over his head, and you shall anoint him. Exodus, it goes on, it says, And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons, and you shall consecrate them to minister as priests to me. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil for me for your generations. It shall not be poured on the flesh of man. You shall not make it like any of it in its portions. Proportion, it is holy. It shall be holy to you. The issue is this. There was a special recipe on anointing oil. Special recipe. You take a hen of oil, whatever a hen is. And you take 250 shekels of myrrh 
or 500 shekels of myrrh and 250 shekels of spicy cinnamon, and it specifies spicy cinnamon, and 250 shekels of cassia, which is a tree, it's the bark of the tree, and then 500 shekels of columnus, which nobody knows what is. So even today, we cannot duplicate the anointing oil completely because <laughs> we don't know what it is. It could be 30 weight motor oil for all we know, okay? Okay, we don't know. But so it, what the issue was that they didn't want anybody taking the holy anointing and oil and using it for anything else. See, they didn't take baths all the time. You know what they did? They would anoint their head with oil almost every morning. Okay? And they would come in. Jesus says, I came into your house. You gave me no oil for my head, but she has continually anointed my feet with her tears. It was a normal thing to have oil made available for people when they came into your house to slick their hair down and take the oil off and slick their face up and look pretty. It was kind of nice. They didn't have a whole lot of problems with... with um, dry skin you're oiled up you you know you could, the eye of the needle you could slide right through no okay you weren't supposed to use it for your private use why it's because the anointing is not for you to use for your private gain it's not about you it's about them it's not about something you're supposed to use for yourself pretty amazing Psalm 133, one of my favorite passages. This is the entire psalm. I love these when you can quote an entire psalm in three verses. It's okay. It's a song of a sense. It's from David. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is, the living of brothers even in unity. It, the unity, is like the precious oil on the head that ran down on the beard, Aaron's beard, going down to the mouth of his garments. That's a lot of oil. It's got to go down through everything, down his beard into the collar of his garments. Everything. Okay? This is pretty. This is oil. Anointing is like the consecrating oil of anointing. Which brings us to a very interesting point. And the fact is that if you are saying, I've got it, nobody else does, that's not unifying. When you're saying that we are the only ones. No, that's not the way it is. It's unifying. It's got to unite the body of Christ. And you'll find that a lot of the times the people you're ministering to are people who've been alienated in the body of Christ for some reason or shape or form or something. And what are you doing? You're bringing them back into the body of Christ. Your ministry is an anointing ministry that is bringing unification. Okay, and to finish it, like the dew of Hermon coming down from the mountains of Zion for on the mountains of Zion, for there Jehovah commanded the blessing life until everlasting. If you ever look at the map of Israel, Mount Hermon is the highest point, and all the dew gathers off Mount Hermon and runs down and becomes the Jordan River. Okay, so just let you know. Christ, our Messiah. Now the reason I put it like that up there is because both languages mean the same thing. Christos means he who is anointed. Messiah, Mashiach, means he who is anointed. Okay? Creo and Masach. They're both the same word. Anointing. Okay? Very simple. Who is Christ? He is the anointed one. He is the anointed one. So the question I've got for you is if the ministry you're doing, are you doing it in Christ? Then you're doing it in the anointed one. Doing it outside of Christ is not a good idea. No, it's not anointed. No, it's not a good idea. Okay. He is king, he is prophet, and he is high priest. Hmm, he's anointed all three. Prophet, priest, and king. All three. All the anointing resides in him. He carries it beyond the law. He carries it beyond what the Old Testament had because he fulfilled it all. Carries it into a deeper place. A complete deeper thing than we've ever seen. We are in him. He is in us. I've taught on that a little bit. <coughs> Once or twice. Amen. We are only anointed as we are in submission to him. One more time. We are only anointed as we are in submission to him. This is very fascinating. 
Because in a session, you guys have all experienced a time in a session where you had no idea what you were going to do next. Am I the right people come to this one? You have your whole oh boy. That's anybody that's ever been in a session in any way, shape, or form. You go, oh, now what do I do? And what's really funny, they all say, well, what would, what would Lee do? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> no, what would Jesus do? That, wear your bracelet, whatever, the WWJD. What would Jesus do, okay? Your anointing is coming from him, okay? On a regular and continual basis in my office, I'm sitting here going, okay, Lord. If your anointing doesn't show, I'm toast. I have no idea what I'm doing, where we're going, or how to resolve this. And it happens all the time, but it doesn't matter because the anointing does come and the Lord shows you things and, and anoints things. And, and uh, Mary Lou has sat in on more sessions than anybody in, in my sessions. And she goes, wow, where'd you, where'd you learn that? Oh, right, sitting right here right now? <laughs> Right here. This is just, hey, and it worked. <laughs> and yay. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> you know? I rely on the anointing every day. But we can be anointed in every single way. We can be anointed because Christ is anointed. And Christ is in you. And you are in Christ. Well, you should be. Remember the issue about being Christ in you. He says, I'm never going to leave you, never forsake you. He's in you. But you being in him is a choice. That's why he tells you to abide in him. Interesting. Interesting. So we are kings. We are prophets. And we are priests. Doesn't mean we have the office of king. It doesn't mean we have the office of a prophet. And doesn't mean we have an office of a priest. But we have the function of king, prophet, and priest. And I'll explain that in a bit. But Isaiah chapter 61, 1 through 3 says this. The Spirit of the Lord Jehovah is on me because Jehovah has anointed me to preach the gospel to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and complete opening to the bound ones, to proclaim the acceptable year of Jehovah and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to appoint those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of infirmity, so that one calls them trees of righteousness, the planting of Jehovah, in order to beautify himself. I've taught on this passage so many times. It is a key passage. It's a linchpin. When Jesus came out of the wilderness being tempted of the devil, 40 days and 40 nights fasting, that'll get your attention. And he comes out victorious over the temptation of the devil. Immediately, he went into the synagogue. Immediately. I mean, he's just right there. And the first thing he did is he walks up to the scrolls and he opens the thing up to Isaiah chapter 61 and he reads in their ears this passage and he stops it right there to proclaim the acceptable year of Jehovah and he stopped right there hands the scroll back to the attendant and says this scripture is now fulfilled in your ears the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to heal to to do it all I'm here it has now happened I am anointed by God baptized in the Holy Spirit because that happened just before we went on the wilderness, remember? He got baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized in water, baptized in everything, and he's in there, and then the Holy Spirit drove him out in the wilderness. Boom, he come back in and says, okay, the anointing is happening, here it is. He has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. Now, what is your anointing? Your anointing is this anointing. It, there is no difference. You say, well, her anointing is different than her anointing. Not really but the manifestation of how it works out through the different vessels will manifest differently, but it's the same anointing. You're anointed to do what? Preach the gospel to the meek. Okay? Does that mean everybody's supposed to be out on the, the, the street corners preaching? Well, more of you should be doing it than are. Okay? But preaching the gospel to the meek is what? Is proclaiming the good news to those who are submitted. We do this all the time. When somebody comes in and finally submitting to the things of God, what do we tell them? I've got good news for you. Mm -hmm. I am proclaiming to you. I, there's nothing as fun as sitting there 
ministering to a couple who's on the verge of divorce. They're ready to just be destroyed. And you sit there and look at them and you feel the anointing just rise up and go boom. And you sit there and say, there's hope for your marriage. God, that's an awesome feeling. To sit there and go, there's hope for your marriage. And they're going, I don't see how. I know. <laughs> but I have enough hope to fill the room, okay? It's all good. We're, you just hang in there, guys, and we will see this thing healed. And it happens on a regular basis. What are you proclaiming? Good news. Okay, good news. There's hope for your marriage. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I love it. It's good news. Can I be healed? Uh-huh. Good news. This is our gospel. This is our anointing. How exciting. How exciting. I love it. Acts 10, 37 through 39 says, You know the thing that happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed? Jesus, the one from Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all those having been oppressed by the devil because God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They did away with him, hanging him on a tree. What, what was the testimony? How God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. <coughs> this is exciting. See, I don't, I don't have to worry when I'm ministering to somebody. I don't have to worry. Do I have enough? <laughs> Do I have enough? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because the Bible says that God, when he gives the Holy Spirit, it gives it without measure. How much of the Holy Spirit do you have? Whole bunches. Whole bunches. <laughs> Technical term? Yeah. You have all. You have the Holy Spirit. For one, he indwells you. For two, he is on you, not just in you. How much more do you need? Uh, it always amazes me when I hear Christians saying, oh God, give me more power. Where is God going to go to get more power for you when he already gave you his Holy Spirit? Run down to Kmart, get a blue light special on power? Where is he going to go to get more power? You have more power than you know what to do with. What should your prayer be? Oh, God, get me out of the way of your power. I have seen the hindrance, and it isn't God. <laughs> it's like, huh? The anointing. Let's understand it a little bit more. It's the enhancement of the Holy Spirit. It's empowering of God to do. Fascinating. It empowers ministry. Now, Carolyn was saying, okay, I know we're being anointed for face-to-face -face ministry, but um, is that all? No, because this isn't anointing for just face-to-face -face ministry. It's just anointing for these people who have said, this is what I want to do. And it is a, a service for that ministry. But man, the anointing goes so much further than that. In what ways can you be anointed? <laughs> all of them. This is a service where we're showing just a physical thing that's going to show a spiritual thing on what is going on. What are you anointed to do? Oh, this is, this is fascinating, okay? Healing, not just face-to-face, -face, physical laying on the hands. I know that happens. That's going to be there, okay? Writing, huh? Speaking, Motorcycle riding? I don't know what it is. I, I, I couldn't come up with anything. It just was there. Okay. Whatever. Okay. But it, it's something that God is doing. Okay. What are you, you going to do? You're enhanced to do it. Teaching. Talking to people. Witnessing. It doesn't matter. What are you going to do? Separate the anointing. I'm anointed in this. I'm not. No. I'm anointed. Now, there are some things I'm not talented in. There are some things that I know that God does not call me to. Okay, I have never seen or felt the anointing through me for evangelism. Just, I'm, I've tried everything. Okay, not there. It's okay. I've got some of the others and that they're satisfying to me. Okay, that's okay. I know what it's like to when I'm a teaching and the anointing comes in. I feel that. I know what that's like. 
I know what it's like when I'm starting to sing and the anointing comes on. You see, it doesn't matter how talented you are. What matters is how submitted you are. Now, I love listening to Miranda sing. I love listening to Mike. I love listening to, to Trey. That was pretty good this morning. It was, it was huh? okay. Is that okay? Little, little okay? Yeah, I'm sitting here just, I can sit, just sitting here just feeling the anointing just flow through his fingers and flow through his voice. You know, I, I love to watch when somebody's doing something. I love watching Miranda because she kind of gets lost in what she's doing. She doesn't really care if you're out there or not most of the time. She's just lost in the anointing. I love that. We're empowered to do the ministries. It's when you're not doing it in the flesh. Amen. Can you shut off the anointing? Yes. It just, it happens. And boy, it hurts when you're doing it in the flesh. Boy, you, you got to learn to not do that. When it has effect on people above your talent. When it's affecting you. And your talent can only take you so far. Now see, I'm, I play many instruments. I play none of them really well. Okay, they're okay. I can play guitar for a while. Play bass, it's good. I can play keyboard, it's okay. None of them are as much as the other people I know who are stronger in those instruments. Okay, I can sing, I'm okay. It's okay. I don't care. I know the anointing takes me above my talent. Okay. What if I mess up a chord? I have messed up a chord every single time I've played my guitar. That's right, huh? Yeah, it, it happens so often, you don't even... Uh, uh, Trey, have you ever messed up your fingering on the keyboard? Never, ever? Yeah, there'll be a repentance time right after the service for lying. No, uh, just... Yeah. See, just like, it's, we can't, we're not good enough. Praise God. I don't ever want to be good enough. I want to be able to rely on the Holy Spirit doing it. Now I practice. I do try to get better. <laughs> Sometimes I really? Okay. And people go, that was after you practiced? Okay. Now, you can use your anointing as a king when authority is needed. There have been times in my office when authority was needed. All of a sudden, okay, right now, I'm kicking in the king anointing. This is my area of rule. And demon, you have no ability to speak or to manifest right now. Shut up and get out. Anointing. I don't have to rely on Lee's authority and Lee's ability to think it through. No, Lee a lot relies on the anointing of the kingly authority and they leave. It's the way that works. Every time. As a prophet, when a word is needed, um, one of the things we teach in face to face is try not to prophesy because we want them to hear it from God. Yeah. However, there are those times where they're not able to hear it from God, especially at the very beginning when I'm, I'm saying, ask the Lord, ask him, Lord, is there hope for my marriage? And they're so busy fighting with each other, they're not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's really hard to get them to the point. And so sometimes you have to speak a word of prophecy and say, there is hope. Okay, I have to speak prophecy. And I love being prophetic, but I have to really keep that dude under the reins whoa, way back. Okay, so that the other anointings can fly. And that is as priest. As priest, when connection with God is needed, now this anointing, this is when you let the reins out. Let it go. <laughs> you say, we are running stampede right, right across the prairie right here. That's right. You can do that as a priest. Just let God work. Pretty cool. Prophet, priest, king, it's all yours. But we are going to be using physical things to understanding spiritual things. We are going to be using oil. It's right there in the scripture. It's all good. We're going to be anointing with oil. It's a physical thing to have a typology of a spiritual thing. Right. And that's a good thing. Anybody here have a wedding ring on? Raise your hand and show me that wedding ring. 
What is that? It's a physical item that reminds you of a spiritual function. Your covenant is a spiritual thing. Okay? This is just a chunk of metal. But it means more to me than a chunk of metal. Okay? It's a physical thing that shows a spiritual thing. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Have you ever had communion? Anybody? One, a couple of you maybe? All right. What is it? It's a physical thing. This matzah is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, take it in remembrance of me. This is my the cup. This cup is my blood, which is shed for you. We take a physical thing to give us a spiritual understanding. Anybody here ever been baptized? Yeah. <laughs> Jeanette goes, yeah. <laughs> Recently, hallelujah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I believe in sheep dipping. It's good. What is it? It's a physical thing to do to show a spiritual value. Well, it's the same thing that's going to be happening today. We're going to be doing some things. We're going to be taking each one up here. We're going to be letting the prophetic speak. We're going to let God talk. We're going to let things do. They're going to kneel and we are going to anoint them with oil with the laying on of hands, imparting gifts of God. So let's, let's show how in 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 22, it says, for as many promises are as are of God, in him they are yes, and in him are amen. For glory to God through us, but he confirming us and anointing us with you in Christ is God, even he having sealed us and having given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Is that deep? Okay, man, together. He's writing to the Corinthians. God confirmed and anointed us all together to do the work of the ministry. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Okay. 1 John 2, 20 through 21 says, And you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I did not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because every lie is not of the truth. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And it goes on to say, He says, I wrote these things to you concerning the ones leading you astray. And the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone teach you. But as his anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, as he taught you, abide in him. Uh, this is a problem passage. This is a problem passage. People who do not want anybody to ever teach them, going up and says, his anointing teaches me everything. You have to shut up and leave me alone. Those are the people who miss it. John goes on to teach them after this. Okay, he's not saying that there is no such thing as teaching, but he says, but in a position, in a situation, when you come there, the anointing is going to kick in and you're going to know what you need to know. And that's very important, especially in a session, right? I'm sitting there going, oh, well, you know, I, I can just hear people say, well, Lee didn't say this was going to happen when he trained us. This didn't show up in the training time, you know? I said, hey! What do I do now? You don't need that somebody teach you. You have the anointing. And as my friend Bruce always says, okay, you just sit in there and listen to the Holy Spirit, trust Him and do what He says. You don't need training, just... You know, <laughs> yes, Bruce, we need training, okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 but you're okay. okay. And the anointing which you received abides in you. His anointing teaches you concerning all things. Three times in the New Testament, it says God is. Okay. Actually, four times, but the fourth time is a whole other issue. But there's three things that we really need to know. We know that there's Father. We know that there's the Son. Jesus, and we know that there's a Holy Spirit. Now, we get these all the time. These are connected. You cannot separate them. Okay, really. You cannot. You cannot separate them in, in absolute ways. You, you say, well, the Holy Spirit lives with me, but Jesus doesn't. Sorry. And the Father also lives within you, okay? I'm sorry. You have an absolute connection to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. You can't separate them. And if you keep, you know, and we've been finding this in, in sessions that some people have a real problem talking to Jesus. That's because they've been messed with 
about talking to Jesus. And they are, Bruce likes to use the Holy Spirit more than he has people talk to Jesus. My people talk to Jesus more. Okay, and I, have, I get a lot of people who they're really, you know, think that the things of the Holy Spirit is all heebie-jeebie and it's all, woo, woo, and so they get all spooked out of the Holy Spirit. It's okay. I, who do you talk to? Well, we've been learning lately that it's really important that when it comes to the courtroom, there's a difference who you talk to. But what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit always takes you to Jesus. What's Jesus do? He always takes you to the Father. What's the Father do? Everybody's going, well, that's the end of the line, right? I mean, are there any more? I don't know. No, that's it. What does the Father do? He brings you to himself, and he brings the real you into your understanding. Okay, kind of fascinating. This is called the person of the Godhead. But three times in Scripture it says God is. Okay? And the first one is, and I put it up here because in 1 John chapter 1, it says, God is light. And it is talking about the Father, even though Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Okay? And we also know that the Holy Spirit is the illuminator. Okay? So which one's light? Yes. yes. Okay? But I put it up there because in this passage where it says, God is light, in Him there's no darkness, none is talking about the Father. We also know... <laughs> In 1 John chapter 4, twice it says, God is love. Now, which one is love? Is the Father love? The Son love? Or the Holy Spirit love? Okay, yes, they are all interchangeable, absolutely. But we know that God demonstrates his love for us. And while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. The manifestation or the way that God showed us love is through Jesus. So I put it down there. That's pretty cool. Okay. Um, we also know that God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In John chapter 4. Well, I put that down with the Holy Spirit because God is spirit and spirit is spirit and spirit is spirit with the spirit. They're in the spirit thing. Okay. That's kind of a gimme. You know, kind of throws there. But is the Father spirit? Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Is it Jesus spirit? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So these are totally interchangeable and they're totally connected. These are called the attributes of God, okay? Attributes. Pretty cool. Now, when light, the light of the spirit realm, comes into the realm of men, there's a term for that. And that's called the glory. Ah, just recently, I was listening to a thing. They're, they're sitting there and they're trying to remember that Thing we were talking about. They're trying to, to define the glory. And he says, well, define the glory. And this guy says something, and then they go on. He didn't define glory in any way, shape, or form. Stop it. Back it up. Now, do it right. Okay. Define the glory. It's kind of tricky. Okay. But the manifestation of light into the realm of men is called the glory. But the manifestation of love into the realm of men that's interesting. That's called grace. That's God's enabling power, and enabling uh, just the power there, the grace of God, how it manifests among men is grace. Now, this is awesome, okay? I love that. What is it when the Spirit is manifest among men? What's that called? Well, see, that's why we're here. Okay. It's called the anointing. So this is kind of interesting. It's when the Spirit is manifest to do ministry. It's called the anointing. When the, Spirit, when the Lord is manifest in love, it's called grace. When God is manifest in the light, it's called the glory. They are connected, and you cannot separate them. Which is why it talks about touch not my glory. When, what are they trying to touch? His anointing. Oh, that's very interesting. What happens when you're sitting there with somebody and you can feel the anointing kick in? What happens? You know that you love them. The anointing kicks in with grace. What happens? It illuminates the problems that are happening in their lives. So what is it? It's light. Can you separate them? Isn't that interesting? Okay. This is called the manifestation. Yay. Now, this is the part I really love. I, I, get, I get tickled at myself because I, when I get to this part because I, I like this part. 
Can you grow in glory? Yes. Yes. Can you? Yes. You sure? Biblically? Who can prove it to me? To go from glory to glory as from the Lord's Spirit. You can go from one level of glory to another level of glory to another level of glory. You can just keep growing in the glory. Can you grow in grace? Well, it actually even says that. To grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, can you grow in the anointing? See, that's the one I don't have verification for in Scripture. But if there's no connection, if there's the connection, no separation between light, glory, and anointing, or glory, grace, and the anointing, you can grow in that too. And I found that in my experience. I've grown in the, in the anointing. It, it gets more. It gets fuller. The more I submit, the more anointing flows. I can grow in the anointing, okay? But there is a force by which... I grow them all. And the force by which I grow them all is faith. By faith, through, by grace through faith, it is the gift of God. Faith is the glory. Faith is the issue where I'm trusting in God and I grow in all of them. Faith is the force by which the Spirit works in that. Isn't that a fun little chart? I've made these out of... Um, uh, paper and put a brad in the very middle of it and spun them. You know, it's just kind of interesting because you can you can put the second triangle anywhere you want it, put the third triangle anywhere you want it. It all fits. But what's the key? The key to all of it is trusting in God. The key to all of it is faith. There is nothing like sitting there in front of somebody whose life is completely just trashed. You better trust God. You better have faith at this point. It's going to happen. Okay? Isn't that cool? Now, I made this, and these are all the bright colors. And then I made the adverse, and they're a little darker colors, so it's going to be a little harder to see. But I want you to see this. Right there. I don't even read it. It says Satan. <coughs> Satan is trying his hardest to promote that he is equal to the Father. You ever seen a yin and yang? It's a lie from the pit of hell. Because darkness is not equal to light. Negative is not equal to positive. Satan is not equal to God. But Satan is there. I put him on the bottom because this is the adverse. Okay? Who's the opposite of Jesus in the scripture? <laughs> the Antichrist, okay, is being going to be and is now, they say the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. There are many things that are against Christ, okay? Very, very heavy. Well, who's the one that's going to be the one who's opposite the, the Holy Spirit? Well, that's the false prophet, okay? So we have the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. I don't know where you stand on it. I know where I stand on this thing. I believe that they are going to be manifesting in a way that we can see them and understand them right here on this planet in not too far down the road. Get used to the idea, okay? They are connected as if you can see those lines in any way, shape, or form. Okay. So Satan, who is opposite of, who is trying to be opposite of God, we can start building this thing as the opposites. What is the opposite of light? Darkness. Very good. What is the opposite? Okay. If Antichrist is of Christ, Christ is love. What's the opposite of love? Lust. You guys are well trained here in this room. <laughs> Says, yeah, I, I drew back a bloody stump last time I said hate. So I just, okay. No, it's lust. So... The opposite of spirit is flesh. flesh. There it is. Okay. This is the negative part of all this. When you start walking in the negative realm, you cannot separate lust, darkness, and flesh. If a person is lusting, is that darkness? Oh, uh, yeah. If a person is walking in the flesh, is that lust? Well, certainly, because it's all about himself. Okay, you, just, you cannot separate them. They're all together. They are linked. Okay? 
That's pretty amazing. What is the manifestation of darkness? That's interesting. What's the manifestation of darkness? The manifestation of darkness is deception. That's where the lies live, folks. Okay, the lies start there in the darkness. What's the manifestation of lust is selfishness. It's all about me. The manifestation of flesh is the opposite of the anointing. Now, here's where I wanted to really get this. This is the one that gets everybody's attention. Because we're talking about the anointing, now we're going to be talking about what is the absolute opposite of the anointing. Okay? You ready for this? Defilement. How does the enemy get somebody who's anointed in something to be taken down? Have you ever heard of somebody who was really anointed in worship, and then all of a sudden you find out that they've been sexually outside their marriage and doing stuff? What happened? The enemy wants to take away their anointing. How's he going to do it? Best way he can do it is by the defilement. He just takes it away right off. So there's a, a real call of God for those of us who are wanting to walk in the anointing to walk in a life that is free from defilement. You're called to a holiness. You're called to walk a fine line of with God, to pursue not to walk in the flesh, to pursue not to walk in lust. This is a very big, important thing. This is why I wanted to bring this up to you is today. What is the charge for you guys? Walk it out. Walk what out? Okay, no defilement. Isn't that cool? So they're connected. Now, is there a force that makes these things grow. Boy, there is. And if you've been around me at all, you know it at all, right? Fear. What's the opposite of faith? Fear. Fear will cause all this to happen. If you go into a ministry session afraid of what's going to happen, your anointing will not show. Your faith has got to be there, not your fear. The anointing. It is you yielding to the Spirit of God. It isn't about you. It's about others. It's always about love. It's always about going out. It's always about that. It's about setting them free and healing them. What a concept, huh? You can grow in the anointing. And that's one thing I, I always sit back and go, wow, no matter what, I know that next year I'm going to be more anointed than I am this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to contain this too awful much because it gets really exciting. Woo! I'm going to blow up. One of these days, just going to be a poof. There's going to be nothing left but just, that's it. Just going to be, that's just flame out, you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> we are doing this ceremony to set things in order, to set things in, in firmness. See, the thing I want you to be able to do, okay? is I want you to be able to go look back and say, at that service, I was anointed. And you'll never doubt again that you're anointed. That's the whole idea. Okay, I have a ring. How do I know I'm married? I was there when it happened. Okay. I don't remember everything that happened that day because I was a little freaked out. No, I was a whole bunch freaked out. I didn't smile the entire day. I didn't joke about anything the entire day. I was wigged. Not at all. I hardly even spoke. I was so nervous. I was so wiped out that day. It was all happening. Nobody had any matches in the church to light the candles with. We found one person who smoked, and he happened to save my wedding. Because he had a lighter. Yay. I sang to my wife as she came down the aisle. You'll never walk alone. The guy who was supposed to record it was late. We have no recording of our wedding. Okay. I could have shot him. Almost did a couple times, but for different reasons. Only because we were okay. 
it was kind of fascinating. But how, I know I'm married because I was there. I know we stood before the God of the universe and this pastor, and we made our vows before God, and we are married until the day I die. I know I'm married. I know it. I was there when it happened. How do you know you're blessed? Oh, I love having blessing services, blessing ceremonies like, like the Bar Barakah. But today, you're going to be able to know, am I anointed? Yes. I was there when it happened. That's what it's all about. Recognize this call of God to this ministry. This group of people are all going to be praying for you while you're being anointed. Okay? How fascinating. It's giving a point of faith that is to be established in your heart and your mind. That at one point, I know, I was received and the calling in my life was received. And at this point, we're going to be releasing gifts to you. Paul said, I want to come to you that I may release to you giftings. Oh, how fun. Oh, what's a gifting? A gifting is an area of God where he anoints you to do that ministry. That's exciting. That's very, very exciting. Are you guys ready? Well, you are blessed and highly favored. Well, let me pray. Father God, I thank you. What a beautiful service. This has been fun today, Lord. And Lord, as you are continuing, you haven't stopped touching these guys. Lord, as they process what all has happened to them today, as they walk through this, Lord, Lord, it is so continuing. There's so much. But Lord, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. We thank you for what you're doing. And Lord, we are blessed to be able to bless these seven. And Lord, we just give you praise for all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You are blessed.